Right, please open your Bibles then to the book of Colossians, Colossians chapter 1, as we will be looking into verses 24 through 29 this morning. Lord willing, we will also allow those verses to look into us, amen? And I'm calling this morning's message, The Ministry and the Mystery, The Ministry and the mystery in these verses we they really have much to teach us about the work of the ministry Uh, what is the motivation behind any work at all that we do for the Lord what's behind it what's the heart of it as each one of us continue and are to continue the ongoing mission of Christ in the world which is to seek and save the lost That is the ministry. But what about the mystery? Isn't that exciting that we're going to look at a mystery this morning? Uh, That has to do with what we receive and what we now offer to the world that is so much in need of forgiveness and love and peace. Anybody need some peace out there this morning? Amen. That's what the Lord offers. Now, when it comes to any task, I'm talking about work or at school, anything that you're asked to do any task whatsoever, in church, wherever it may be, we can gauge the the success of it often upon, does the person know exactly what they're supposed to be doing? I mean, that's pretty important, wouldn't you say? Is the task well-defined? Is the goal clearly understood by the person who's doing the task? Do they have the right heart about it when it comes to serving the Lord? And I found for us a great little story that illustrates this. And the story goes that there was a truck driver who was hauling a load of 500 penguins that he was delivering and hauling off to the zoo. Unfortunately, his truck broke down. He eventually waved down another truck driver who had an empty load and he offered that driver $500 if he would take the penguins to the zoo. The next day the truck driver got his truck fixed and he drove into town. But he could not believe his eyes when he saw right there before him the second driver walking across the road with the 500 penguins waddling single file behind him. He jumped out of his truck. He ran up to the man and he says, what's going on? I gave you $500 to take these penguins to the zoo. To which the man responded, I took them to the zoo, but I had enough money left over and so today we're going to the movies. That guy may have been working hard, but I can tell you right now, he did not clearly understand the task or the goal. He did not fully understand and appreciate what he was supposed to do. The very same thing can happen to folks in the church. They can miss the true task of why do we have a church at all. Perhaps the understanding of ministering is fuzzy to some folks. And the true purpose of it is still a bit of a mystery. One of my favorite Bible commentators is Ray Stedman, and here's what he had to say. I really like this, by the way. The Apostle Paul understands that he is a servant of the Word. His job was to proclaim God's truth. His job... uh, uh, Sorry, I lost my spot there for a second. It is very easy to forget this and also apparently to lose your place. (laughs) We get wrapped up at church in trying to be creative and innovative. We dabble in politics and pop psychology, but this is not our calling. These things cannot save anyone. There is a tendency to make the word of God a servant of the teacher rather than the teacher, a servant of the word of God. It is not our job to pick and choose which part of the Bible we will focus on and believe. We must present and study the fullness of truth. God's word must dictate what we teach. 
not public opinion, not contemporary events or personal preference. Scripture is not for us to use to prove our ideas. We are here to proclaim God's ideas. Amen. Isn't that awesome? I mean, that is so clear and so succinct as to what the church is to be about and ministry. When I read that, I was like, oh my gosh, I can't say that better than he did. So I'll just tell you what Ray Steadman said. You see, successful Christian ministry, it, and that's what all believers are to be, understand that they are not the served but they are the servants. There is a style of preaching that absolutely drives me nuts. Just has me want to scream and yell and throw things at the TV if I hear somebody doing this. And that is where folks are wanting God to work for them. In a sense that they want to mix a little bit of God into their life. And hopefully, if they do that, they'll be a bit happier. Or maybe if they add a little bit of God, then things will go a little bit smoother for me. And in that particular setting, what you have is God is then your servant. And you're the one that's in charge, rather than being God's servant. Where I can get my will done. The way I want it, and when I want it rather than being about God's will and his way. Where God makes my life easier, rather than me out for his glory and the fulfillment of his will and his plan. And I, I see today that a lot of churches are flocking, a lot of people are flocking to those churches, where God then becomes their servant, rather than us his servant. It's a role reversal. And it makes Christian life and it makes Christian ministry something that it is not, that it was never intended to be. And it leads people into a place where they're actually in opposition against what God has called us to do and be. So let's pray. Let me read the verses and let's see what God has for us this morning. Father, we stop now. We pause. We want to hear from you. I don't want this church to hear from me, Father. In fact, I'd ask that you'd help me to step out of the way because Jesus said that the Holy Spirit would be the teacher so Holy Spirit you come and teach you enlighten your word for we pray these things in Jesus wonderful name and everybody says Amen. Colossians chapter 1 starting in verse 24 Paul the Apostle writes I now rejoice in my sufferings for you <laughs> and fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ for the sake of his body, which is the church, of which I became a minister, according to the stewardship from God, which was given to me for you, to fulfill the word of God, the mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to his saints. To them, God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Jesus Christ. To this end, I also labor striving according to his working, which works in me mightily. You know, the attitude, the, the heart of the Apostle Paul is a constant amazement to me. I, I read what he says and his heart towards the Lord and his heart towards people. I, I'm, a cur I'm encouraged by it. I know that that's where I want to be, but it also just flat out amazes me. Look at how he starts in verse 24. I rejoice in my suffering for you. All right, let me ask, have you ever made a statement like that to anybody? I just want to let you know, I am so happy to be suffering for you. I was trying to think, you know, he says this so boldly and, and almost comes across in a matter of fact kind of a way. Of course I'm rejoicing that I get to suffer for you. 
I was trying to think if I ever, even in something real simple, like, sweetheart, I'm about to take out the trash and I want to let you know, I really rejoice in that. I'm so happy to be doing this little thing for you. It just makes me thrilled to take out the trash and suffer on that account. In fact, I took out the trash last night. Did you notice? <laughs> and while I was doing it, <laughs> thank you, thank you very much. You know, it's just one of those little things. And while I was taking out the trash, I was thinking to myself, am I rejoicing in this, you know? I lift the lid of the trash can, it smelled bad. I go, oh Lord, I got a long way to go. <laughs> Paul is doing this from jail in Rome, locked up, handcuffed to a Roman guard. And in that place, he says, I I'm just thrilled. But what is his attitude underneath that? What would make that okay? What could possibly make that okay for you or okay for me? That I wouldn't want to just say, God, get me out of here. How come I don't have enough faith to get out of this jail? Even though I'm suffering for you, Lord. So let me out so it can be easy for me. Where's the peace? Where's the green pastures? And I think what's fascinating about the Apostle Paul is he was able to experience those things even in the midst of hardship. His suffering did not put a dent in his rejoicing. I, I, I'm blown away by that. And when he's sending off this letter to this church, he's thrilled that they're learning something from him, that they're receiving some love from him. They're thrilled. I'm sure that the Apostle Paul is writing a letter to them. Wouldn't be, we be thrilled to get a personalized letter from the Apostle Paul to us this morning. I mean, that'd be pretty great. And he's never met these Colossians before. Never went there. He wasn't the one that started this church. And his thinking is something like this. Well, I look at my situation. I'm in jail. And I'm praying for you. And I'm sending this letter to you. And it's for your benefit so, so I rejoice. And, and I was still trying to grasp some kind of place or way in which I could understand that. I think of those in the military. They suffer a lot. <laughs> a lot of heartache, a lot of strain, a lot of difficulty. Sent in harm's way. But there is within those in the military that have that integrity and love for us. Some people love for people that they don't even know. And they're willing to lay their lives, their lives on the line for us. Or I think of, how about at home? Home life, the mom or the dad who'll stay up late, you know, and, and uh, help a child with a project. By the way, how many of us have gotten A's in our children's projects? <laughs> Love that, don't you? <laughs> You're suffering for them. You're putting yourself out for them. Moms are great at this, aren't they? I mean, God bless the mothers with me time for their children. Oh my gosh, you know? Our children who seem to ride on our prayers, they maybe don't realize it for a number of years. But there's the parents, they're suffering for their child's sake. That's the kind of idea. Paul says, I have rejoicing. He has joy. And we know that the joy that the Bible speaks of in the Bible is not circumstance driven. That's not joy at all. Joy is not based on blue skies, fair weather, and pixie dust. Joy is much deeper than that and is based on Jesus, on knowing him, serving him, and bringing him glory. Do you remember that old saying, something about, you know, clouds and uh, silver linings? Every dark cloud has its silver lining. Have you heard that one before? Maybe your mom told you that one. Well, if that's true for anyone, then it is absolutely true for the believer in Jesus Christ. Because everything that happens in our lives, God can work out for the good. So you say, oh, the kids in school, why did I get that teacher? How come I'm in this class? Why am I in this school and not in that school? Hey, God can work that out for your good. God can make that right. Why is my mom so mean? How come I have to clean my room? Hey, God can work that out for good. But well, I tell you, I'm, I'm glad my mom doesn't see my room anymore. <laughs> She'd be on me like white on rice. 
Every dark cloud has its silver lining. How true for the believer. So right off the bat, we see a couple of things which are integral to uh, ministry. <coughs> Ministering is others-centered, not self-centered. It's not what you can get out of it. It's not how it makes you feel. It's not, uh, you know, any of those things. It's others-centered. It's not self-centered. And ministry is joyful as the one serving looks to Jesus for their joy. Everybody will disappoint you. Do you know that? Have you experienced that? You'll even disappoint yourself. I can't believe I said that. I can't believe I did that. It's a lot of disappointments, but not the Lord. He won't disappoint you. He's good to us all the time. And as Paul says that suffering for the church, the bride of Christ, more needs to be done. He writes in verse 24. Now I rejoice in my suffering for you. Fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ for the sake of his body, which is the church. I, I know you look at that sentence and you go, boy, that sentence structure, I don't know if I grasp it. It's kind of oddly written as far as the Western eye is concerned. I can tell you right off what it does not mean. It does not mean that Paul the Apostle needed to do additional suffering in order that we would have salvation. We know that can't be true, right? Because Jesus even said from the cross, what? It is finished, paid in full. So Paul's suffering for the church, he's not talking about salvation. But he did suffer, didn't he? He did work hard. He was in prison. He was shipwrecked, sharing the gospel. He was beaten. He was even robbed of his life and the Lord brought him back. He has a great joy because God has given him the opportunity to work for him. I was talking to a brother the other day who uh, hadn't had work for a long time and then he got some work. And he had this big smile on his face. And I said, well, how's work going? And he goes, oh, I'm so happy to be working. Oh man. God is so good. I said, really? He said, yeah. Uh, in fact, he goes, I've got it figured out now about work. And I said, oh, well, tell me how it works. How does work work? He says, well, I go, if somebody's going to hire me and use me, he goes, I go in there the first day and right off the bat, I'm just working as hard as I can. I just like, I'm going to impress them so that they'll call me right back. Wow. What an attitude, huh? Sometimes we forget these things until we don't have a job or God brings something in our life that causes difficulty and we're no longer happy at what God has given us. So Paul the Apostle, that's not him. Now, let's see if we can come to a clear understanding then of the word that the Apostle Paul uses to describe himself. Uh, you know, what's the job title that the Apostle Paul gives himself? I mean, what would you like to be called? executive home director of all good things and I'm really great there you go <laughs> uh, I remember one time that uh, that this was a long time ago uh, there was a fellow that came to church for a while and boy he he wanted to teach so bad and uh, he's moved off to Texas now I think it is but he uh, he kept telling me uh, can you put my name in the bulletin and I said, well, why? And he says, because I, I like to teach the Bible. I'm, I really want to teach the Bible. And uh, of course I didn't. And uh, then he was like, well, at least can you give me a business card with a church logo on there and my name on there? And, and uh, finally I didn't do that. He came up to me and he goes, look, I got my own cards made up. And it said Bible instructor. And I said, well, who are you instructing? He says, well, nobody yet, but I'm ready for it. You know? and we get wrapped up sometimes in titles and instead of what it is that God has asked us to do. So look at the title Paul gives himself, verse 25. Of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God, which was given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. Paul is a minister. And because Paul the Apostle picked that word, a minister, 
Down through the centuries, we now all take that word for granted and we use it in a lot of different ways. <coughs> I'm a minister. We call ourselves ministers. But the question then becomes, what is it that Paul the Apostle meant when he originally used that word minister? Was he proud about it? Let's do this. Whatever comes to your mind right now in regards to a minister, uh, why don't you just erase the chalkboard? Let's just pretend like we never heard that word before. Uh, minister. What exactly is that? Uh, here's another Bible commentator, and here's what he wrote. The word in the Greek is diakonos from which we get essentially the word deacon. It has its basic meaning in table waiter, or if you will, less than that, a busboy, not even the waiter, the guy who picks up the dirty dishes, the guy who serves the waiter. The waiter takes the order, the assistant waiter brings the food and takes away the dishes. I was made a waiter, he says. I was made a busboy. I was made a server. So when he said, I've been made a minister for you, he was not in any sense of the word puffing himself up. Excuse me, from now on, will you please call me Mr. Minister? I mean, let's, you know, I, 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 I've been to places before where they give me a little name tag. The worst thing that I like to see, the thing that I hate to see, is sometimes it'll put on they'll put on there if I go to a breakfast or something and say Reverend Paul Aguilar. I could just scream, you know. It's like anybody got a scissors, I'm gonna just snip this part off. Look, there's only one person to revere. And that's God. He's the only one that has a revered name. I don't have a revered name. It should say, as Paul the Apostle said, it should say, Busboy Paul. That's what he was saying here. So to these people that he didn't know, but he loved and they were receiving from him, he says something like this, which I say to you today. If you need it, if I can give it to you, if by anything I do, you'll come closer to God by me. If you'll be established in the Lord by some work, some prayer, some service that I can do, then know that it is God who has made me to be your waiter. That's what ministry is about. You know, we, we have some folks off on Mexico, at Mexico ministry right now. And, you know, Mike and I served in ministry in Mexico for a number of years. So when we send out missionaries, we pretty much know what to do now. Uh, we hear back, you know, in years past, we heard back from, uh, you know, different uh, missions where we can send people. And the, here's the kind of word from, from missionaries who churches send helpers to for short periods of time. They usually say something like, uh, well, you know, Pastor, if we're going to be truthful with you, you know, this is not a retreat. You're not sending people here on a retreat. And uh, sometimes uh, people that come to us require more work than the people that God has sent us to minister to. So we've adopted this policy around here when we send people on missions trips. We look in their little faces. Mike and I do as we pray for them and send them off. And we say, look, here's your job. Your job is to go there and find somebody that's doing something and help them. <laughs> your job is to keep your antenna up for somebody who needs prayer, for somebody who's carrying a pot, for somebody who's setting up a table, for somebody who's doing something and it looks like they're struggling on it. You take over. You become a busboy for them. And now I hear back from people that we send on missions trips and they're like, hallelujah, send them back anytime. You don't even have to set up a date with us to come. Just anytime you want to come, come. We love you guys. You're great. 
And I always say, oh, I told you we'd send you our best. <laughs> our best table waiters. Our best bus boys. Do you know that that's what God's looking for? He's not looking for your education. He's not looking for your ability. He's not looking what you think you have to offer. As a matter of fact, that usually gets in the way. That's the very worst thing that can do is you can go to God and you can say, look what I know, look what I can do. And the Lord's like, oh my gosh. And so what does he do to folks that are like that? What did he do to Moses? Moses, one of the most educated guys at his time. Great ability. He had his act together. What did God do with him? He sent him to the backside of the desert for 40 years until he was mumbling and he was watching over a flock that didn't even belong to him. It was his father-in-law's flock. And then he was like, Lord, can you send somebody else? Is there anybody? Well, I, I'm slow of speech. Why would God do that? He take a somebody, turn him into a nobody so that God could use him for his glory. And he's still doing that today. Don't bring God your ability. Bring God your willing heart. And I'm telling you, God can do anything in and through you. Don't limit him by what you know or don't know. Don't limit him by where you live or how old or young you are. Moses started at age 80. Well, you're just about ready, Moses. <laughs> <laughs> and that's when God began to use him. Because he said, I'll be your servant. And it said, Moses was the humblest man that ever lived. Wow. It's interesting to me that when the, when the world begins to talk about leaders, the world uses words like, we're looking for movers and shakers. We're looking for people with power, even intimidation, leverage, wits, or presence. But I want you to know that when the Lord speaks of leadership, he uses words like love, humility, compassion, faithfulness, generosity, service, character, dying to self, godly example, integrity. That's what God is looking for. What a difference then. So Paul sees himself as a servant of the church. He's not a professional, but he's a waiter to those that God has given him to love and establish in the faith. So let's go through some of these things again that we've just pulled out. Ministering is others centered, not self-centered. Ministering is joyful as the one serving looks to Jesus for their joy. Ministering is humbling and looking to serve the needs of others. Ministering is fulfilling God's word. Verse 26. The mystery which has been hidden. Oh, here we go. We did the ministry. Let's take a look at the mystery. The mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to the saints. That's a pretty interesting statement, isn't it? I mean, this says something special is about to come up. Paul is saying, this is Christianity, something that was not previously known. A knowledge that was not revealed in the Old Testament. All those Old Testament saints, they didn't have a clue about this. I doubt that the angels had a clue about this, what Paul's about to tell us. Something which has become the very bedrock of our faith. Some mystery which cannot be known through natural research, but is revealed by the Spirit of God. Something to be known experientially. What is it? Ready? Verse 27. To them, God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. That's us. Here it is. Which is... Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Here's that same verse from the Phillips translation. That sacred mystery, which up until now has been hidden in every age and every generation, but which is now as clear as daylight to those who love God. 
They are those to whom God has planned to give a vision of the full wonder and splendor of his secret plan for the sons of men. And the secret is simply this, Christ in you, yes, Christ in you, bringing with him the hope of all glorious things to come. Maybe you'll remember the Lord Jesus Christ saying in the book of Revelation, chapter 3, verse 20. He said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. That puts him on the outside, doesn't it? If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, here it is, the mystery, I will come into him. I'll come into him and dine with him and him with me. That speaks about intimacy with God. Jesus Christ offers to indwell those who trust him, those who give their lives to him, those who would invite him in. His plan is to make your heart his home. You know, when I was thinking about this, you know, I, I actually thought of uh, Christmas. And usually at Christmas time, you know, we, we uh, recount the, uh, the story of uh, Mary and Joseph and they're traveling and uh, they go to that innkeeper <laughs> and they say, let me, Joseph's like, let me in, my wife's about to have a baby. Which is a panic time sometimes. Isn't it? <laughs> Please let me in, you know. No, don't have any room, go away. We're all mad at that innkeeper because he doesn't let Jesus in. But where does he put Jesus? Out on the stable. And we even get madder. We say, that rotten guy out there with dirty animals and, and the hay, and that's the son of God, and he's born out there in a state. What's worse than that? And I thought of what's worse than that. And it's the human heart. But we say, Christ, come into my heart. You think you're doing him a favor? <laughs> Wait till you see what you get when you get me, Jesus. <laughs> And I think, oh Lord, forgive us for not recognizing this, minis this mystery that you've so freely given to us. So this is glorious. This is right now. Christ in us as we live in this fallen world. Christ in us is our hope of glory right now and of glory to come. He himself becomes our hope. So it is not our goodness it is not our great spirituality. It is not our hard work. It's not our great knowledge. It's not our list of rules that we particularly follow. It's not our devotion. It is the abiding presence of Jesus in us. Wow. I get to walk with... Do you know that believers are never alone? Once you put your faith in Christ, you will never be alone. It just will never happen. Not now, not throughout all eternity. Jesus Christ is right there with you. When you're at school taking a test, when you're at work and your boss is upset with you, when you don't have a boss, but you want one, <laughs> God is right there with you. He's right there in your marriage. He wants to become a part of every single thing you do. And guess what? Guys, he's flat out in love with you. I don't know this God who's always condemning. I don't know. Do you see him in the Gospels? I don't see him. What's he like then? What is God like? It seems as though he takes the lowliest. The, uh, the lepers that nobody will touch and nobody will visit and everybody wants away from them. Folks threw rocks at them so they'd go away. They had to ring little bells and shout leper. They shout out for Jesus and he's like, let me heal you. The woman caught in the very act of adultery, let's stone her to death. Jesus is that. You who are without sin cast the first stone. The woman that had the issue of blood, well, because of that, she couldn't go in the temple, couldn't go to services, couldn't go to any of the celebrations, had to live separate outside the camp, it said, Moses said. She pushes her way through the crowd, grabs a hold of Jesus, just touching the hem of his garment. And even though Jesus had the paparazzi around him at that time, 
and all the people are pressing and they're all moving for Jesus to go heal somebody, Jesus slams on the brakes. Ooh, who touched me? They're like, <laughs> Peter's like, what are you talking about? Don't you see all these people here? I perceived that somebody touched me and power went out of me. And there she was. Lowly woman on the ground seeking Jesus. Always to the lowly. Always to the humble. Well, look, he did speak pretty tough to the proud, didn't he? Those that thought they had it together. You bunch of whitewashed sepulchers, he told them full of dead men's bones, but not to the lowly, not to the humble, never turning anybody away. How do you like a God that says, attention universe, <laughs> anybody who comes to me, I will never cast away. Come on, you like that, don't you? I mean, that's the God that we serve. Verse 28, him we preach. <laughs> warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ. Okay, that's the work. That's the work that ministers do. Present everybody perfect in Christ. I don't preach to you so that you'll have the best life now. <laughs> I don't preach to you so that you'll have it easy or that you can name and claim that Cadillac you've always wanted to drive. So let me ask this. Uh, Paul says, I'm going to keep doing this, preaching, warning, teaching. Which, by the way, would be great on a tombstone, wouldn't it? He preached, he warned, he taught. <laughs> in a wisdom that was not his own. So that he could present every man perfect in Christ. So let me ask, anybody here that's perfect? Okay, so we still got some work left to do. And Lord, help me, Lord, help us here to be intense about it as much as the Apostle Paul was. Well, how intense was he about it? And we'll close with this. Verse 29. Paul says, to this end, I also labor, striving, which is the Greek word agonize. I'm, agonize, I'm agonizing according to his working, which works in me mightily. Mightily to preach, mightily to warn, mightily to teach with the wisdom that comes from God. It's his striving, it's his laboring. Again, you see this great relationship we're to have with God. It doesn't mean we let go and let God in the sense that we just sit back and do nothing. <laughs> That's not what we're called to do. We can work hard for the kingdom of God, can't we? Laboring and striving. Because it's God that works in us. It's a strength that's not our own. All right, as I'm thinking about this, let me uh, preach, warn, and teach right now. God and his word are never to be taken lightly. And I think if there might be even some here today that have never really had that, that starting point where they said, yeah, I'm going to follow Christ. Or maybe you're one that have had a lot of stops and starts. Off and on. Your alternator's busted. <laughs> Can't get going. This could be the very morning that starts that for you and the Lord. Where you follow him wholeheartedly, never turning back. You tell him, you're my God, and I'm your servant. In fact, that's all that needs to be prayed. Lord, I hear your voice. I know you're real. I know that in this moment of quiet, you're calling me into a deeper relationship with you. So Lord, I give you my life. I ask that you would come into my heart. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Not your goodness, not your works, but simple faith in Christ. Come in, Lord. Be my God. Be my friend. And I'll follow you all the days of my life. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this morning. I thank you for my brothers and sisters in Christ. I thank you, Father, that Pastor Mike and the prayer team will be available.
to pray for any of those that God has laid upon their heart to make sure they have salvation. I thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are our teacher. And I ask that you continue to teach us the full counsel of the word of God. We love you. We praise you this morning. We pray these things in Jesus' wonderful name. And everybody says. Do you notice I was just